Welcome to Yogi Views, where my guest is yoga itself, through interviewing those who practice it, teach it, sell it, or simply love it. I am Antonio Sausis. Yoga is the science of integration, the body of knowledge that expresses that all existing things are integrated and function as a unit. For yoga, the opposites are part of the unit. So light and darkness, the absence of light, are part of one continuum, light. This is why perhaps yoga is seen as one of the gateways to understanding duality, and more precisely, to transcending it. There are many styles of yoga. Styles are a more modern concept, and they, and they refer to different ways in which yoga can be practiced. More traditionally, branches of yoga addressed ways in which yoga understands aspects of the self or of reality at large. One of these very well-known branches of yoga in the West is Hatha Yoga, the yoga of the body. But today, I have a guest who has expressed and explored very important concepts and aspects of Jnana Yoga, the yoga of the mind. He's also credited with being one of the founders of modern yoga in the West. His name's Joel Kramer. Joel, welcome to our show. Thank you, Antonio. It's good to be here. Joel is a yoga author and pioneer whose teaching aims at making yoga relevant for contemporary living. By freeing yoga and spirituality of its authoritarian roots, he's contributed to the emergence of an amazing amount of creativity that we witness in the modern panorama of yoga today. Joel, yes. um, there's one question that most of our viewers usually like to know, and this is, how did the yoga path start for you? You know, as a very young person, I was always interested in, you know, very, in four basic questions. And the questions were, what's going on here, really? Can I even know? If I can know, at least partially, how do I go about finding out? And how do I fit as a human being into the scheme of things that I find myself in? In order to explore this, I went to a traditional Western route of uh, Western psychology, philosophy, uh, postgraduate school, things like that, until I f felt that I had integrated Western perspectives fairly well, but didn't feel that they were answering in a very direct way the basic questions that I was asking. At, at that time, uh, Eastern thought was beginning to, you know, filter in, mm -hmm. you know, to the consciousness of the West. And I said to myself, well, you know, I explored Western thought. Let's see what Eastern thought is all about and began exploring that through some traditional routes until I found a, a Yana yogi by the name of Krishnamurti, who fascinated me not because of the conclusions that he came to, but fascinated me because I saw that he was developing a methodology of the mind exploring itself through a self-reflexive process where you can actually take a look at how your own mind works. And I found that a very different and very fascinating way of trying to explore my place in the universe. And so using that methodology, I began to see what a highly conditioned, although well-trained mind I had how it was, you know, very conditioned and in many ways very predictable. Now, as was the fashion of the times, there was a connection between the mind and the body. And as I saw how stiff my mind was, I also saw how stiff my body was. And I became aware of uh, Hatha Yoga by watching you know, somebody who had studied it five years in India, 
uh, you know, watching him very carefully. And he fascinated me, the way he moved as an animal and, you know, the way that uh, he presented himself. And this was my first introduction to the physical aspects of yoga. And at that time, yoga was very primitive in this country. For example, a headstand and a lotus posture were considered enormously advanced postures at that time. Mm -hmm. And having a genetically very stiff body, I began to gather information around me, talk to people, look at books. And actually, on my 30th birthday, I sat down and realized that, you know, the way you learn this thing is by doing it. So I sat down, got pictures and books around me, and began to approximate or try to approximate some of the postures, which I couldn't do at all. But I also realized that the process of yoga was not gaining the final posture. The process of yoga was being able to find out where the edges of your resistance are. And it's here that I developed the concept, which is now used by many teachers, of playing the edge, playing mm -hmm. the edge of your conditioning. And as you play the edge with more facility, what happens is the body begins to move, the body begins to change. And then I began to see how, as the body began to change, and it's very hard to put an exact you know, isomorphic relationship to it, I began to see my mind becoming more flexible also. So I began to see the relationship of the mm -hmm. two. And the interesting thing is from the first day I did Hatha Yoga, I did it for 20 minutes, and I didn't miss a day for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. It, you know, something in it, you know, clicked in me, so to speak. And that's kind of how I got into it. Hmm. So interestingly enough, your actual entryway was through the yoga of the mind. That's right. Mm -hmm. That was my actual entryway. Now, it is also true that you develop, uh, I would say, a great amount of wisdom in the Hatha Yoga. I have seen some pictures of you uh, doing a, a lot of uh, interesting postures, and I understand that you also uh, understood a lot about the yoga of the body as well. Well, you know, that came in time. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. as, you know, as many things are. And I was also curious. I was also curious to the extent that this vehicle that was genetically very inflexible, how far it could go. So that in my first, I would say, five or ten years of doing physical yoga, I was into pushing my edges to see, you know, what this thing was possible of. To do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by most people's perspectives, I became quite advanced mm -hmm. in yeah. doing postures. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, over the course of, you know, many years, I've been doing yoga now for, I guess, 43 years. Over the course of years, my emphasis and, uh, you know, the way that I do it has changed. Uh, you know, my perspectives about it have changed to some extent that uh, I now look at yoga as a uh, participant, as is so many things, a participant in an evolutionary movement that is part of the times that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And that I find that its relevance is that it brings an energy and an openness to allow one to assimilate change so that you don't get stuck in habit patterns. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and we'll go back to this evolutionary aspect of it, but I'm uh, uh, right away intrigued. Do you think that this is one of the reasons why yoga is so popular now in the world? Because it's helping us with our evolution and because we need it. I think it's possible, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I think it's uh, fashionable or popular for many reasons. You know, the one that I was talking about is one of them. I think it's also popular because it is the kind of physical activity that can broaden your awareness, and it's something that you can do all of your life. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can live with and grow with and evolve with, you know, in one fashion or other. So I think that the, uh, there is that 
reason for popularity. Another reason for popularity is because of the ways that it has branched out into what you were referring to as, you know, the different styles, styles you know, work differently for different people. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, there is more access, you know, basically. And for even those who are, you know, just fundamentally interested in the physical benefits, I think that's fine. If you are interested in the physical benefits, the physical benefits are there and it can open you up to other benefits. Yes, exactly, which mm. is a, a concept shared by many teachers and masters that mm -hmm. regardless of the momentary uh, physical appearance of yoga in the West, it, because it is yoga and because yoga is this union that is happening regardless of our uh, acknowledgement or aware of it, then other parts of yoga, one is naturally invited to them. And some people do and some people and some don't. Some people don't. And that's the way it is. And, you know, and, you know, from my perspective, you know, all of this exploration with, uh, you know, different schools of yoga is a good thing. It's a good thing. Yes. Yeah, it's a good thing. Now, still, Yana Yoga or Yoga of the Mind is not the most popular, is not uh, the, the most well known. Well, you know, it's also, one, it's also one of the more elusive things. You see, the interesting thing about Hatha Yoga, which I consider to be a sort of ground in yoga, mm -hmm. because it's very easy or relatively easy to uh, fool yourself in the mind and to even fool yourself emotionally, but it's hard to fool yourself, to, to lie to yourself in the body. In the body yeah. So that it acts as a ground, uh, showing you where certain limitations are. It also shows you, uh, you, know, you know, things like how greed works, because if you get greedy in yoga, mm. the body lets you know mm -hmm. <laughs> very quickly. Yes. And uh, so that it is a, uh, you know, the kind of relationship that you develop with it is something that can keep you open as you move through life. Now, at my age, I'm not nearly as flexible as I was when I was mm -hmm. 30 years ago. And yet doing yoga has become increasingly more important to me mm -hmm. as you know as the aging process has continued because you know it's like the aging process will happen inevitably inevitably mm -hmm. it, it just does happen but you know i laughingly say that yoga is a way of aging with some real elegance mm -hmm. and it's not only the elegance that's important it is the way that it keeps other parts of your system, your emotional, your mental parts, alive and vibrant. Mm -hmm. for, because for me, what yoga is, in its essence, it's, you know, what I call an energy game. Tell me more. You, because basically what you are doing is you're playing with energy. The energy inside of your body, from a physical point of view, the energy that your mind either develops or cuts off from a mental point of view, and even the energy in relationship, because, you know, relationship and communication is part of, you know, what breaks the boundaries between the internal and the external, mm -hmm. basically. Yes. And, you know, and so, you know, keeping that alive and vibrant as one ages, because if you look at the aging process, you know, either you know, either you're aging in a way where you become more highly conditioned, more rigid, more predictable, or you're aging in a growth pattern. And uh, I personally prefer the latter to the former. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and but that's work, <laughs> isn't it? Well, you know, it takes doing. It, that, that's work, yeah. exactly. Well, you know, you know, I define work as something you don't want to do, basically. Ah. <laughs> to me, it's not work. To me, it is, you know, just part of the life that I lead. And uh, I find myself, you know, down on the mat on, uh -huh. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think of it as work. Yeah, uh, you know, as doing. You, you named it as doing. doing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a better, better word for it. <laughs> Tell us a bit more about the yoga of the mind, which is not what people m mostly know about yoga. Okay. 
you know, all of us, I think, are aware that mentally we have a self-reflexive capacity. In other words, we have the capacity of reflecting on ourselves. And, you know, generally speaking, this is done in highly conditioned ways. So, you know, so that when you reflect on yourself, you're generally reflecting on what you want or what you like or what you don't like or how people are affecting you or things of this sort. The yoga of mind is very, you know, it's like changes the emphasis, changes the point of entry that you're reflecting. Because instead of, you know, wanting your ambitions to be realized, which is the nature of an ambition, it wants to be realized, mm -hmm. or, you know, or, uh, you know, running away from what one is afraid of, one becomes interested, for example, in the nature of ambition and how it works, in the nature of fear and how it works, not trying to make it go away, not trying to control it, but really interested in how it works in you and how it affects what you're doing and how it creates what I call mental filters. Mm -hmm. and, and what I mean by a mental filter is the way the mind filters information. And I'll give you an example of a, melt, of a mental filter. It's like preference hmm. is a mental filter. Mm -hmm. If I prefer something, I will tend to integrate my experience out of that preference. Now, I'm not saying this is good or bad, or the preference is right or wrong. I'm saying that is the way filtering systems work. Just like memory, uh, you know, can be an adjunct to uh, exp exploration, or it can, you know, filter the way experience is coming in. Mm -hmm. Because I remember you hurt me once, and then I think you may hurt me again, and things of this sort. Exactly. So that you begin to see how the mind begins to internalize experiences. And in the very process of doing this, something, not all the time, but something quite remarkable can happen. And I'm sure that it has happened to many people most people have had an experience where in for a moment for an instant one has you know what might be called an epiphany a seeing clearly and then when you see something clearly that very very seeing changes you it's not that you see and then you change mm. it's like the seeing itself changes you mm -hmm. and you're in a very different place so that, for example, uh, you know, I tried, as was part of certain traditional perspectives, to uh, eliminate uh, the competitive aspects of my mind. When I saw very clearly that my mind is programmed to be competitive, mm. <clears throat> as a, you know, you know, as an animal, there's a genetic component to it. Instead of trying to do away with it, I was curious how it affected my mind and the world around us, and saw, for example, that instead of being, you know, something to control or get rid of, how competition and cooperation, as you mentioned, are sort of embedded holes that actually define each other in you know, different sorts of ways. And the very seeing of that allowed me to, uh, you know, to utilize the competitive aspects of my being, I, I thought, in a more creative, more life-furthering way, mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of using competition as a way of diminishing another person, Or basically. blocking or yourself blocking. or others. So, yeah, so, you know, that's just an example that I'm yes. trying to give you mm -hmm. of uh, the, you know, the exploration of one's own mind, mm -hmm. you know, basically. And, you know, one of the places that it led me. Because, you see, in yoga, you know, you know, one of the things that's almost taught by rote is, oh, it's not a competitive activity and we don't compete with each other. Mm. But if you're in a yoga class, you will notice how everybody is sneaking a peek to yes. see how everybody else is doing yes. and things of yes. that sort. And I'm not saying this is wrong, but I'm yeah. saying that we do learn. And then I 
was really interested in evolutionary theory and I saw how competition is a honing device mm -hmm. that evolution uses. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's like to hone excellence and that we wouldn't be able to be sitting in this room talking together about these topics without a whole history of human beings both cooperating and competing to see who found the double helix first mm -hmm. or yep. got to the moon or created the technology that allows us to do yes. what we're doing. Yes. So that it really changed my perspective on a lot of things, uh, you know, and that it is still a foundation for me in terms of uh, exploring whatever self-awareness I have and it's, you know, it's still important. Now, Joel, two things. One of them is that it is, even though um, uh, here uh, in America we are not used to yoga competitions or we see with a little bit of uh, disbelief mm. yoga competitions, uh, I've been in touch with many Indian uh, masters that uh, do promote competition. Their schools compete, the kids, and yeah. one of the things yeah. they say is that rather than the kids learning about drugs in the square or learning about other things in, in, the, in the local town, they are actually competing to be a better yogi and with it a lot of goodness comes right and, so yeah you know and you know and, and i would agree but i would also say that one has to be you know you know competition even cooperation both of them are somewhat double edged because mm -hmm. you know if you you know if your competition you know pushes you beyond the uh, beyond the limits of you know what your you know what your body or mind can appropriately hold. It's not that good. Yes. And, yes. Exactly. Uh, yes. You know. Hurts you. It hurts you. Yeah. It hurts basically. you. It, it hurts you. Now you are mentioning self inquiry, and we know from the Hatha Yoga, we know that the poses are techniques, right? Uh, uh, excuse me. Are what? The techniques. Techniques. Yes. Techniques. Yes. In order to accomplish more flexibility uh, or to develop a certain chakra or energetic place in the body, or to get into certain uh, arenas of the body. Certain, exactly. You know things like that. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Is this self inquiry the main technique of Yana Yoga? I. It's like traditionally that has not been the case. Uh -huh. It's like traditionally yana yoga had to do with, you know, being able to uh, read or through verbal exchanges uh, imbibe, you know, uh, you know, previously thought to be wisdoms. Mm -hmm. uh, as somebody who has been questioning some of the authority of the past, I would say that from a very personal point of view, I would answer that question, yes, it's the fundamental technique. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and from learning from the inside, then you have a certain facility of being able to examine how past people who engaged in yoga, how they formulated or articulated what they were doing, and you know, mostly what one sees is that uh, you know that they present a different worldview, whether it be an Advaitist non-dual worldview, or whether it be a Vitist or dualistic worldview, mm -hmm. or things like that. So you can begin to watch and see how people begin to, you know, build a a container, mm -hmm. you know, to hold their experience in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I saw in myself and I, you know, projected perhaps rightly or wrongly, I think rightly onto others, is that part of the way the human mind works is it wants to build a container mm -hmm. in order to integrate experience, in order to try to understand, you know, what's going on mm -hmm. around us. So that I have, uh, you know, and for me, the uh, interesting thing about yoga is that in the momentum of my life, I have seen my container shifting, changing. Mm. And, uh, you know, to me, that is feedback that I'm onto something relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
um, the container that the mind wants to create. You just named it that perhaps it is in order to understand. Mm -hmm. Now, then I would say that the mind has a hard time getting rid of those containers in order to understand the coexistence of the opposites. When you were saying today cooperation and um, competition. Uh, competition, not one, just one is the good aspect, not the other one just per se is the good aspect, it's, it's good to understand the interaction of both. And, and they're they embedded. I mean, I, I mean it's, it's very simple. Teams cooperate in order and compete. In order to compete better. Exactly. You know, basically, mm -hmm. you can see the mm -hmm. intertwining, mm -hmm. you, know, in that, mm -hmm. you know, in that kind of thing. So would you agree that the mind then has a hard time transcending the container? You see, here, you know, you know, here I would say this. I would say it doesn't have a hard time. It has an impossible time. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that I would say this is this, is that there are moments when the mind breaks out of its container mm -hmm. and it begins to see something from a different point of view. But if you're very alert in terms of watching how your mind works, you see your mind working to integrate that new experience mm -hmm. into a broader container. Mm. You know, so mm -hmm. that, you know, this is a process. I see. And I look at this as a never-ending process, mm -hmm. actually. This concludes the first part of a two-part show where I'm interviewing Joel Kramer. Uh, Joel is uh, a yoga author and pioneer whose uh, teaching uh, aims at um, ma uh, making yoga relevant um, for our times and the needs of our times by freeing yoga and spirituality uh, from their authoritarian roots uh, Joel had helped and uh, elicit, in a way, the very important emergence of creativity that um, marks and uh, had marked our contemporary understanding of yoga. Uh, I hope you enjoy this show, and if you want to say something to me, please shoot me an email at antonio at yogiviews.com, and uh, I look forward to seeing you the next time.